I'm just like the picture is always bad. Hey guys! <laughs> sorry, sorry, <laughs> sorry. We're trying to find a. She always catches me like, and I'm like la la la, looking off somewhere. <laughs> Welcome to Jerry's Live, episode number forty six. Uh, canvas stretching when the dollars make sense. I, um, as always, am your host, Amy Gardner-Dean, and we are here to discuss canvas stretching for you to learn whether it's right for you, uh, whether it's, you know, timely, cost-efficient, I mean, whether you work on a lot of different types of surfaces, that can be a bonus, just kind of all the things that are related to canvas stretching, and then even some about if you don't want to do it, but you want custom stuff, we're going to talk about our canvas stretching program, which thankfully, holla, Amanda is the assistant manager of customer service, our moderator, and she's also the one that should you ever need to call and talk about the custom stretching program, that's who you're actually dealing with. So it's awesome because she can help answer questions if anybody has them during this episode on the custom program. Um, just kind of an, an update. I know a lot of people have been still messaging me and asking about how my brother's doing. If you uh, were around back in, I guess it was at the end of January, beginning of February, wasn't it, Katie? Mm -hmm. uh, we had to cancel a couple shows because my brother uh, had a very dangerous situation happen and uh, ended up in the ICU and was in the ICU three and a half weeks, almost lost his life. Uh, he was released from the hospital yesterday. Whoop, whoop. So uh, seems none the worse for the wear. He is very exhausted because he was he was basically laying down in a in a bed for a three month? and a half weeks in yeah. ICU. Yeah, and uh, and he he does have a brace for his leg. He's got a little bit of nerve damage from all that. But but the doctors actually expect him to make a full recovery. So it's really awesome. And thank goodness for that. And you know what? I I think without you guys' support and and just love and care and he was he was absolutely flabbergasted that everybody was uh was thinking of him number one when he started kind of realizing what was happening in the hospital and what was going on we we're all saying you know all the different people that were kind of sending support he he was very grateful to everybody so thank you on on his behalf as well as mine um this episode is going to have an after party because this is kind of like not the easiest thing to show in um, low resolution of Facebook for canvas stretching. The canvas stretching after party, we uh, go over kind of discussing stretcher selection. We discuss how you put cross braces on larger canvas uh, frames. Um, we even stretch some canvases. We even make lots of mistakes, don't we, Katie? Mm-hmm. I, it, we, we, we always film the after parties way ahead of time, obviously. Um, so that we can do the editing and all that. Um, Will can work his magic, for those of you that know Will. Um, and we did it the day after I came back from being out with the flu. <laughs> and I was not, I don't even think I was at like 40%. What do you think, Katie? I started stretching a canvas and using tacks without like actually stapling it first to make sure that it didn't start leaning and coming apart when I was stapling it. So it's very... A, it shows that everybody can make mistakes, even people that are seasoned, and, and it shows just <laughs> kind of some of the common stuff. Also, we had a, a stretcher bar incident, didn't we, as well, just in that, you know, when you get stuff. That makes it sound really stretcher bar. Not as bad as it sounds. It's, it's, no, it's not like a wardrobe malfunction. <laughs> Thank goodness nobody needs to see that, but it was, <laughs> it was... It was that, you know, when you get things, especially when you uh, do mail order with stretchers, always good to look at them, unpack it all right away, because sometimes in transit, when things are coming from um, overseas, you will get uh, just some humidity, some warpage sometimes, just it's, it's impossible to avoid. It's it, rare, it rarely happens. But it does happen sometimes, and we did catch one uh, that was warped, and it was, as I was saying, hilarious because I've used that brand for forever, and it was the first time I ever got one that was warped. And of course, it was when we were filming because that's how stuff happens to me. So, um, so you'll we'll have the the link posted to that, so you guys can watch that. Um, and I think Mike even just as a canvas. Uh, learns how to do that for the first time. It was the first time Mike had ever done any of that. He did a fantastic job, and actually, I think this is the one that he did too, wasn't it, Katie? Mm-hmm. 
So with one coat of gesso, he actually did a pretty good job on the corners for not for not, not knowing what he was doing. Yeah, for not having any clue. So, um, so it can be done easily by a first time person, even led with somebody who's still really not effectual at all. <laughs> so, so anyway, that will be the after party uh, for Facebook Live group members for the Jerry's Facebook Live group. Go to the uh, Jerry's Facebook page. You can sign up. It sounds like, what? Well, how many people was it, Amanda? 30-something people that haven't answered their question. Mm -hmm. They send you a question. It's not taking a poll. It's just to make sure you're not a robot. It's not some automatic subscription. If you have submitted uh, asking for approval into the group and we haven't gotten back to you, it's because you didn't answer your question. So you need to do that if you haven't. You're not sure what to do just i guess resubmit right and you guys can yeah if you go back to the page and it'll, it'll say your pending request okay so they um, can click on just click on it again and it'll, okay. it'll ask you a question so again. do that to join we have 370 members strong that's amazing i know it's a helicopter it's not it's they're not coming for us so <laughs> I, they probably can't even hear that on facebook but yeah, it's I'm loud. Sure. um so anyway so if join the group uh it's up and running people are posting stuff it's very funny I love the stuff that everybody's got going on so and you know what I think an art, everybody's been asking like cool questions as well I think one of the best questions that I saw last night um, was Laura had posted about um, what do you do when uh, Laura is a professional artist and like when you get kind of those mindless tasks where people hire you to do artwork and your heart really isn't in it and just kind of suggestions and all that. So stuff like that's really fun because it gives people kind of something to do. And what I would tell Laura to do, and I was gonna answer it, but I thought it might be good to have a question a week that we deal with, is um, create some sort of assignment for yourself with it. Um, if there's a color that you've been meaning to use, uh, a color scheme that you've been trying to work on, um, if there's a, like even sometimes I'll take a color and hide it linen flower, Charvin linen flower, gets hidden and stuff, kind of, that gives me something to look forward to, like a little funny, you know. It's your own kind of Easter egg. It is, it is, it's your own kind of Easter egg, just something like that, or, or make it a challenge with um, maybe trying a technique that I've wanted to try, but haven't either mastered or just haven't had the chance to been able to, to give a shot on that. It just, it makes it so that there's something to look forward to that will keep you working on it rather than being like, Oh my God, I'm going to go do the dishes and take a break because, you know, oh, oh, the laundry needs changing. Darn, need to dash away from this. So, um, so those are some ideas. So, uh, anyway, I guess we will get to this canvas stretching episode. Um, <laughs> there's pros to stretching canvases. There's also cons to stretching canvas, just like anything in life. Um, as an artist, as I dropped my paper, <laughs> no, didn't throw that, it just fell down. That's okay. Um, <laughs> that's for Jess Wing later. Um, there are, are some things that you need to kind of take into consideration with that. The pros for this, when you're customizing your own canvas, I mean, this is basically custom canvas at its finest. You can select the structures that you want. And with, as far as I'm concerned with me, go big or go home. We had somebody on the Facebook group that, had posted uh, an issue with a canvas warping. This is where you can ensure that doesn't happen. Sometimes, you know, torquing your canvas down in your easel can cause some warping and twisting and bowing. If you use heavier duty stretchers, you know, heavy duty stretcher strips or whatever, you can actually control basically the durability and the size to your canvas. You can have, if you've ever put, God forbid, but it's happened to everybody. Hey, Katie, has it happened to you where you've put a, a brush through a canvas? Yes. Or, or a palette knife yes. or something like that. Or my elbow or something. With this, you can control the thickness of the canvas. You can, can control you know, it being beefier, hardier. Um, you can control the depth for a specific frame. You can go frameless. You know, with, with a gallery wrap, you can you know, go all the way to just a thin three quarter inch you know, thing, or even make your own panels. I mean, with with uh, canvas or linen that you buy separately. There's, the only rules that apply to it are kind of what you decide. Um, now, 
you can see what the stretcher quality is before you actually use it. That's kind of the bad thing about buying a canvas that you can't see behind per se. If there's not a lot of great shots online is you don't know, does this look like it can really stand up and hold up to stuff. You can see what the real integrity of it is. Um, the aluminum composite bars, that's something that you can look into those types of things for making your own canvases. Um, you know, if you really have a problem with things twisting and warping, if you're in a really humid area, maybe you don't have air conditioning in your studio and you're in, you know, a swampy part of, of Georgia or Florida or, you know, Mississippi, Alabama, North Carolina, it's, it's swampy here. Yeah. It, it is, it's, especially if you're, Katie laughs, she's grown up here. If you're from anywhere else, it's swampy. <laughs> um, you know, those types of things do affect canvases and stuff and how you store them can sometimes affect your warping and stuff. So this kind of gives you a way to control those issues not happening by starting with the best, better quality, you know, stretcher bars and things like that that you have available. You can do unusual and varied sizes. Heck, if you do the Bellarte system, which yeah, you've got to buy like the saw and all the things for it, you can you can do to the seven eighths of an inch. You know, you can do odd, weird sizes that nobody else is going to have. Now, you know, you probably want to frame those and not leave those to your clients to then have to go and get crazy custom frames for. But you've got that that ability. Um, to do kind of whatever you want. Um, there's some people that love a particular surface. Hate painting on the same size. My name is Amy and I hate painting on the same size canvas. The absolute worst thing in my life that this job has been, has been having to paint on similar size surfaces. Is it not Katie? I'm sure Katie's heard me bitch oh, about by it. 16. You know, more than enough times. Yes, I just, by 20. I know, I, 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 I don't, I either like weird little small sizes, really long, thin sizes. Doing stretching yourself means that you can have all sorts of crazy sizes, but you maybe still use that same specific linen that you like or canvas that you like. Um, this is a great way to, if you like to try new things, um, Katie, can you zoom over? I got cut pieces. There's cut pieces of a whole lot of different brands that we carry. Um, I wasn't sure what this was because the sticker fell off, but then I got the Art Fix book because I thought it was the L64C. I <laughs> guess what it was. Was it? L64C. <laughs> did you smell it? <laughs> I did smell it. <laughs> so that's how I knew. But look, here's this, um, the Roma Afesco. Look how it's more like a, um, a textured, kind of almost like a stucco. It really is. Um, and then you've got the Pissarro, which is a heavier linen with oil priming. Then you've got the Sargent Herringbone, which has that really kind of crazy, cool texture. So pretty. Uh, you can get it in glue sized, where it's this with just a clear sizing, I believe. Mm -hmm. Or you can get it in that oil primed. So it's just, I mean, you can go, Art Fix has, you know, this is just like a little tiny thin sample book. There are pastel grounds on canvases that we sell. There are absorbent grounds where you can use watercolor on canvases that we sell. Um, if you do the custom, pro the custom canvas program, this is not something you can get, so please, please, please don't write in expecting, but this is, just, this is our reference book for being able to you know, when you call Amanda for her to be able to look this up, say if you're between a couple different styles, I mean, this is all just the art fix that there is. There's all the Claussens that there is. Single primed, double primed, quadruple primed. Some, there's, you can get five and six times primed. You can get them tinted with different grounds for the pastel ones. It's like linen that's like the tent weight. There's so many different things you can do and stretching your own canvas is a very inexpensive way of trying new things when there are you know pieces available to try and deciding what's right. Or just you know trying also just going in with with friends buying like six or seven rolls of stuff and everybody just having a canvas making heyday. <laughs> it's happened Katie. Canvas I've happens. done it before. Yes. 
Yes, instead of that painting party, a canvas stretching party. So that's really awesome. You can take stuff that's raw and prime it any stinking way you want. This is just white gesso with only one coat. I always recommend maybe three. I like three. This is two coats of clear acrylic priming with a tinted ground built into the clear acrylic priming that is just Charvin raw sienna. All I did was took the Winsor Newton clear gesso, mixed it with just a little bit of this. This is just this one beautiful coat of that. I'm gonna go back and do one more because I like tinted grounds, but I didn't want it to be like a dark tinted ground or be streaky. With this, it's a great way to just kind of dry brush it on with that clear, adds a nice color. This was what it looked like one priming ago. This is, can you zoom in so you can mm -hmm. see that it's just, it looks kind of like an oatmeal color. That's just raw cotton canvas. That's that, so you can see the color. It's interesting actually how much it it's just changes really, it with yeah. changes the color. It makes it look like, like a unbleached titanium mm -hmm. or very really light titanium buff, right? So those things you can do if you get it yourself and then you prime it. Now these are on those three pieces. You can't tell squat as to what's what. Some of them are the um, the uh, Creative Mark Pro Bars, the heavy duty Pro Bars, and then one of them is the best brand, um, the heavy duty bars. Same width, same weight, almost exactly. You would never know without pulling that canvas back and looking what was what but they're all heavy duty, they all feel very similar. They're all, it's just one's less expensive because our, it's our proprietary yeah. one. So, um, so I mean, those are things that you can do if you stretch them yourself. That's a big bonus. Um, you can make your own canvas as archival as possible. Something that nobody talks about, which the jury is still out on it with acrylics, but with oils especially, they really recommend that you do it. GAC 100 to seal the wood like this. even with this even though this is spruce wood still has some natural acids in it two coats of this they say anywhere that it's going to touch your canvas what I did when I did mine and I can show how to do this um, in a little bit but I took the bars from here I mean it's up here on the surface of that beading it's not touching that, but I still went ahead and did there. Oh, right. I did there. Yeah. And I did there all the way back to here because it's going to be stapled right there. Just so anywhere that that was touching, where it would rub, where it would be in contact potentially, just kept it from potentially discoloring the surface over time. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm sure I'm never going to be hung in the Smithsonian, but where did Van Gogh think his stuff was going to end up? I mean, he sold like one painting. So you don't ever know, and it just takes a little bit longer. And if you're making multiples, I was doing three of them at a time, it's easy to sand them down, you know, sand your rough edges, go ahead and hit it real quick, hang them up. I just hung them on pegs, hit them one more time, and then you stretch from there, okay? So that's, you can do that. The ones that you get, that you buy in boxes of however many, they've not done that. They've not done that. So you're actually in control of your stuff being the most archival it can be. Um, with this, you don't have to meet a minimum requirement on, of a box of whatever, a box of three, a box of six. It's very rare. We do on our website with some of our canvases now because that was such a problem. It's very rare that you can just buy one canvas in a particular size. And actually, in some ways, it's more uh, you're, you, you run into the problem of it's actually more possible that it's going to get damaged in shipping if there is only one in yeah. there. So you don't have to meet, you have to buy six of a 16 by 20. You know, you have to buy three of a, of a 20 by 24. So you don't have to, to deal with that. Um, and then we just said less damage of shipping. Amanda, question. However, there are minimums on bars too. There are. Now, how you can get around that on some of them is with 
proprietary ones that are that are kind of our bars um, you can do assorted sizes, mm -hmm. which means, you know, if, there, if it's a minimum of 12 bars, that sounds like a lot of bars. There's four bars of canvas. That's only three canvases, right? So it sounds, although that sounds bad, yeah. it's really not. And that's, there's nothing to say that you can't, you want a 30 by a 48. You can't buy the 30 by 48s and then buy two eight by eights you know, to enough for two eight by eight. So it's not, it's not like it's ridiculous and you've got to buy the most expensive ones. So if it says assorted, there's creative ways around it. Okay, how do I know that? Because I did it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, oh gee, did I do that? Yes, exactly. So, okay, so there's that. And that's one of the cons. The biggest con, and I, and I really hate to say it because you know what, I, really geek out on making my own canvases because I love doing woodworking and I have a sculpture background but it's time time and more time how much is your time worth as an artist are you somebody who already works 40 to 60 hours a week my name is Amy and that's what I seem to do <laughs> then how long is it gonna take me to prepare a certain number of canvases how much time between housework and kids and dogs do I have after I've done all that. Now there's ways around it in that maybe quarterly he makes a bunch of canvases. You go in and invest in the stuff, you take a week and that's what you do. You enlist friends to help you. I mean, there's, there's all sorts of ways around that. So you just need to uh, really weigh that option of kind Does of- Does it work for you? Right. right. What does it fit into your time constraints? Because if time is money and you might have a $5,000 commission, with a weird size, but you know, doing the preparation to make it like the perfect surface for painting that commission is going to take you 40 hours with yeah. buffing and doing everything else, or, or God forbid, you know, you need to do your own oil priming and stuff just because of, of what needs to happen with that, and then it would need to cure as well. Then you're starting to run in the point where it would just be cheaper time wise. It might be a little more upset to just go ahead and, and do it through the custom canvas program and get her done, get it to you, go from there. Um, well, and how long does it take you to actually paint too? Some people paint yes. really fast. Right. Some people paint very slowly. Right. So it's just, it's, it's being awareness of time and, and what that does to you. Um, Using primed linens and canvases, that's a way around the time. If it's already primed, that will help save you some time. Yeah. Um, you know, think of, think of what the coats take for each dry coat. Because there's time in between that you can't be doing something. Yep. Um, there's a learning curve required. Not going to lie. It, it is. And as we saw in the after party, if you're not on your A game for the day, Sometimes being tired and worn out and all that is not the time to do it. It's kind of like um, driving while tired. It's kind of the same kind of thing. It's me every Christmas when I wait to the last minute and have to wrap all the presents. It's like that. It's the exact same thing. It's I'm like that where Katie, where Katie just <laughs> takes it, wads, wads the wrapping around it, and then takes the tape and does this. This is good. You don't want to do that for your canvases. Um, although it, 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 for some people, if you've, if you've, if you've got great dexterity, you're pretty handy. Um, that learning curve is going to be so fast. I mean, yeah. I learned to do it. It was very easy. Once I'd done two, you'd never known that I'd only done two. I've, I've always been able to do it reasonably quickly, nice and clean, nice pretty corners. Um, but some people not like that, and that's okay because you got other things that you're good at. So um, it's easier to stretch unprimed versus primed. Uh, because trying to tighten up the prime, sometimes especially with oil priming, can lead to cracking, which isn't really a good thing. Um, there's also the, you know, you don't want to rush it, you want to do a quality job. So sometimes you might have to slow down, make those corners prettier, make it tighter. Um, lining up the canvas and keeping it square as you stretch is something a lot of people don't think about. I don't know how many people have seen where It'll be like this, and the weave has slowly turned this way. And so you see yep. it coming off the thing, which with this, like this now, isn't as obvious. As soon as you prime it, oh, hello. hello <laughs> the, whole, the whole world can see it from 10 feet away. 
So, so that's something that you need to be aware of too, is you've, you've got to really pay attention to that. Uh, if you know you're not great with detail, maybe not the best. Um, the spacing of the staples and the tacks, you want to learn to make them, to space them out. Even You don't want 900 staples in the back of it. That's just not. I really want my canvas to stay on there. Yeah, right? well. <laughs> so, and then also dealing with the excess in the back. How do you trim it? How do you secure it? You know, um, there's, there's different ways different people do it. Um, I'm, I think I'm pretty good at tacking it down so it's not coming up and flopping around. I've seen some people that leave way too much. I've seen some people that don't leave enough. And if they have to re-pull it at all, it's starting to, the strings are starting to come up through the staples and it's starting to come up to the priming with the kind of fraying. So, um, some brands of stretchers, if you do it yourself, are drop shipped from the manufacturer like Best, which is not a problem. It saves you money. It saves us from having to have it shipped to us and then shipped back out again. So that saves you on price. However, it's two to three weeks to get that stuff to you because we've got to get the order to them. They have to get it pulled and put it together, get it on a truck and then get it to you. If you're in a rush and need to stretch canvases, you know, a week from now, that's not going to work for you for getting it from them. Okay. Just, just saying you need to be aware of those timelines like that with drop ships. And also custom canvas. Well, the same thing for custom canvas. Custom canvas doesn't mean that somebody, you know, is standing there canvas stretching pliers in hand waiting for that phone call to come through and Amanda calls him and he immediately makes it and sends it out that day. That's just not feasible. We've got a lot of people that, that use the program. So it's something where it takes, you know, a while for them to get it and get it out to you. Sometimes it's a lot quicker than others, but just you need to be aware of, of that. And if you've got questions, ask. Okay. Um, extra costs for large canvases. Oversized canvases usually require a truck delivery, the big LTL delivery. Um, if you're doing that and buying canvases instead of making your own, it's a good idea to call and talk to somebody in customer service because you might be able to, okay, so I need, um, I need a couple of what 48 by 72 is right Amanda that's gonna go truck size it's mm -hmm. what above like 36 inches is kind of that 36 by 48 yeah 36 by 48 is the magical breaking point uh, where where it becomes truck freight you might be able to get eight boxes of that for the same shipping mm -hmm. price as one box not always but it goes by like pallet size that it takes up in the truck. And when it's already gone that long, they allow extra width, all that. It may be the time to go ahead, especially if there's a sale, stock invest up. in that, stock up. Then if it's, you know, $150 for drop ship, but you can get eight, seven boxes of that for that price, rather than only three canvases for that shipping price, that makes sense. If not, you can get stretcher bars. <laughs> you can get linen. Or whatever you want to stretch and then you don't have to deal with the oversized stuff I mean sometimes that can be the big the big cost issue um, so that's something where you talk to a rep here really to friendly. see but I mean that's it's what it's what they do it's what, what we're supposed to do so I mean that's that's what we're here for and we're here to help help solve those problems so um, another thing that depending on how handy you are the initial offset for for stretching can involve investing in some tools, okay? You need stretcher bars, obviously. You need crossbars. If you're getting anything larger than like an 18 by 24, you're looking at crossbars. Just to be smart, just to keep it from warping. And putting your um, elbow through it? Huh? And putting your elbow through it? Yeah. Well, <laughs> even, even something like the Museo, then you're looking at hardware kits yep. and stuff like that that you might not have figured into cost. Um, if you're getting something raw, you're dealing with primers, priming brushes, you're dealing with staple guns, staples. If you don't have like strong hands like I do, you're dealing with a canvas stretcher. Scissors, uh, you want screwdrivers for putting in your hardware for your uh, crossbars, flathead one for popping out staples that get jammed in there funny, um, pliers for pulling staples. 
a, a square for making sure that your corners are square before you secure the bars before you start stretching. A hammer, you want this, not a regular That's hammer. Mad. You want a mallet for being able to gently put it into place without putting dents gentle in it. Gentle persuader. It is the gentle <laughs> persuader. Just ask my husband. No. <laughs> That's a good idea. No. <laughs> Kidding, maybe. Um, copper tacks, if you want to avoid all the other stuff and in just a regular hammer. Um, I mean, there's all sorts of things that go into the prep, doing your cat to make sure that it's as archival as possible if that's important to you. Just, there's tools, there's outset for doing this. Once you do it, then that's already there. And you know, a, a lot of this stuff is stuff that I've used for forever. and. Really, these work better than just from having had hand surgeries. I can't grip like that as strong as I can pull. Well, and there's a couple of different kinds of pliers too. Yeah. So find there's, the there's one that works for you. Times. Yeah. Yeah. Some and of them are wider. Some are smaller. So there are, and and some of them, some of them, the ones that are best, and the ones, the two that I got to show, and I think that we showed them in the. They have a spring in between them, so it makes it a little smoother. Um, they make metal ones, but they don't really grip and hold as easy. That's got, um, like a nylon thing. This has an even softer nylon and this, Grippy. look how much slower it opens back up. So if you start slipping, it's not quite as easy for it to pop open on you. Um, this is a little smaller, the, uh, the, as far as it opens up. So yeah. it's not quite as hard of a pull. Someone with real small hands might have a hard time with that. Well, I think one. if I was stretching something like this, I'd probably have to use that. Yes. Someone with, with small hands would real, definitely have problems with this. These are for big man hands. Big Why? Man hands. Huh? Oh, I thought you were saying I had man hands. I do. That's okay. We, we all know that. Um, so, I mean, that's, that's something to consider. Okay. Um, and and even um, your um, giblets. <laughs> I say it because Amanda hates it. <laughs> You're the worst. I am. Thank you. <laughs> uh, you know, th these are going to be your keys for putting in the back. You, you may need them with some canvases. It's good to have them just in case, you know, you go from humid to dry, dry to humid. You've got them if you needed to tighten it up. Maybe, if, especially when you're new, you might need to tighten it up a little bit that way after the fact. So, so those are all the things to consider with that. Um, Amanda, in a minute we'll take questions. So if you've got a list, which it looks like you do. Yep, I do. She's got a list. Um, with the custom canvas, if this sounds like, it's like already you're like, ah, like a Muppet. <laughs> You don't, this is this just already sounds overwhelming. <laughs> Did I break? I broke a cake. No, just that's, do you not sometimes feel mentally like a Muppet? No, where I, you're yeah, just like, I ah, like do the Kermit the Frog. And, ah! Yeah. Yeah. Um, the, you can get custom ones done because it, if you do any commissions, you get people ask for the weirdest, strangest things that are not standard stock ones. Or maybe it's a standard size, but you are just never, ever, ever gonna paint in that size again. Um, you can call, you can talk to Amanda. Um, it's a great way to get a specific size without buying a whole roll of canvas or linen, without all those tools that you need, without the stretcher bar minimums, and without the time, the effort, the struggle, and may I say the swearing. <laughs> because that's, <laughs> Because that's sometimes thrown in there yeah. too. So, or if you don't have the space, sometimes people just don't have a they, table. Yes, big it does. It does take some space. Um, and and it, and it kind of has to be that clean room situation. Mm -hmm. I put extra canvas down because uh, when I did these at home, uh, you can't see it on the side because I was able to scrub it off. There was a Charlie. Oh, there's still a little bit of a Charlie nose print <laughs> because the clear gesso is absorbent, yeah. and he came in from digging in the yard and went. Burp. Yeah, so helping. so you know, there's there's that kind of aspect of of I where I live now. I would stretch here because I don't have room in yeah. my little house with with them running around all the time. So, um, but what's the lead time? What do you generally tell people, Amanda? Just so I know, Apparently, and I'm not. 
It's about two to four weeks. Okay. Maybe up to five. It depends on availability and the weight, the line of front. Yeah. Okay. Line Words. ahead of you. Right. The line ahead of you. So anywhere from two to four weeks on average. On average, yeah. Depending on the weight, that's something if you call, she's got a much better yeah. idea of lead time. Waiting until the last minute, hemming and hawing, do I order the linen, do I do this, do I do that, do I check every store within a 50 mile radius to see if they have this odd size, hem, ha, hem, ha, oh my gosh, I'm going to have to have it made, I need to start this in a week, this is not the time to call. So just saying, as soon as you know, it's a good way to get just get a quote, find out time, find out price. Now, Amanda did say, and this is something I had no idea, I don't know if you even know about this, mm -hmm. Katie, for the custom canvases, the shipping is included in the price. Oh, no, I didn't know that. I didn't either. Mm -hmm. It's materials, labor, and shipping all together. <sighs> so if so, it looks like a lot, it also includes your shipping. Yes, okay. and so that's what you need to understand, is if it looks like a lot and it includes your shipping, consider that the, I think, I talked to Josh that does our UPS freight, and he said that, um, that it's like $155 is the general for something that goes truck freight. So that's shipping, that's what it would cost yeah. anyway. Oh, so more than that depending on yeah. what size you get. So I mean, if that's included, Or where it's going. If that's already wrapped into, you know, the, the shipping and the discount and all that is wrapped into that, that's actually a pretty good good deal for something where you're never gonna paint in that size again and not have, have that extra stuff hanging around where somebody's gonna put an elbow or a dog's gonna put a paw through it. My dogs have put a, an easel through a window before, so think of what they could do to canvas that's just sitting around waiting, so. Yeah, I have a cat that likes to yeah. make yeah, biscuits yeah. on our canvas. <laughs> <laughs> Not as crashing like post. Shredded on yes. one side, yeah. All right, questions. Okay, how can a rookie tell good bars from bad bars? Also, Patty wants to know if bad bars are called bad bars. <laughs> <laughs> No, they are now. They'd be my favorite <laughs> bars then. Um, okay, so a good, this is actually a great question. All right. Do, 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 do. Let, me, let me get a visual. Okay. So good bars from bad bars. When you get bars shipped, you want to look down the front. It's just like checking out lumber. You close, notice there's an eye closed. You look down the bar, if it's straight and true, when you're looking down it, then you turn it to the side, turn it that way, it looks good. You will see it go off one way or another way or start dropping off or kind of veering up, okay, if it's off slightly. Um, you wanna look for good clean edges where everything's, you know, routered nicely. Sometimes it's there is a little bit of chippiness or it could be, could be sanded. This isn't like a precision thing. This isn't furniture, okay? It, it just, it happens. But you don't want it to be all chewed up. There to be giant knots in it everywhere, you know, that are that are anywhere your canvas sits where it's like a hole that's going to damage it. Um, and the same for even the heavy duty ones. We had a, hand me that big one that's all, that's the one right behind it. We've got them stacked back there. Yes, and, and hopefully they can see this. I was messing with them earlier, so I don't remember which one's which. very short. Ah, uh, okay. So. Is that the right one? Uh, yes. Is that? I think so. Yeah, it looks like it goes. Yes, it's because this one was warped this way. When I turn it this way, I don't know if you can see. I was going to say, hold it up it straight. Twists. Can you see? It's I can't. It's see hard to see. It, it, where I'm looking, looking down it it twists out this way. And I'm, I'm very particular. I can pick out from having done woodworking for a long time and build a lot of stuff. I can totally see. But then when I turn it this way, I can see that it goes whoop. Yeah. We went to put this together and it, the corners couldn't fit together because one side was like up here and down there because the way that it twisted, it just couldn't be put together. And I said, Anytime this happens, this is why there's always a box, sign on your box that says to check your order within what, 48 hours? Yep. Call well, customer service. Don't, or, I mean, you can email, I guess, but uh, you know, talk, us. yeah, yeah, contact us. Let us know, give us a count of how many are damaged. 
if there's more than one, what the problem is, it's a good idea to even take pictures. It doesn't Absolutely. hurt. Absolutely. Because you know what? Stuff gets done a lot faster if we don't have to email back and forth 90 times, you know, oh, blah, 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 can you send us pictures, whatever. They will get on that. Stuff gets replaced. And so we can't, we offer a proportional refund. Right. So, so that's, don't put it in something in a closet. Wait six months down the road when you finally go to stretch these. If you want to keep them in the box, great. It's a great way to keep them safe. Pull all of them out, look at them, make sure everything's good before you um, just put them up for storage. Because if it's not, we can take care of it right away. And like I said, it <laughs> that brand I've used all the time, that's what two of these things are. I love that stuff. Never has happened before, and then it goes to happen as soon as we go to, to film something. And I should have looked at them the night before, but I, I unpacked it like at nine the night before, yeah. knowing we were going to film the next day. So, um, so that's how you look at the bars to tell. Uh, other questions? Yes. What's the best way to store your canvases before you paint on them? The best way to store your canvases are standing upright, absolutely not leaning, not leaning, not flat. Even, even if you've got stuff with bigger pieces of wood in between to keep them safe, it's still not a good idea to have all that weight on them. Have them, you know, standing, standing just here. This is easiest because it's small. Straight up, like that. Stacked. If you have to lean them against each other at all, make sure they're the same size. Put them face to face because it keeps dirt and gunk and everything else from anything potentially touching it, damaging it. So you've got them face to face like that okay if you've got other sizes always have something that's resting on an edge because that can yeah. go through it okay especially if it's smaller if it's significantly smaller get a piece of just a board or something something heavy use my drawing gonna... boards in between them to keep them off yeah because i've had people do that watch when other people come in your studio and start looking yes. through canvases next thing you know all your yes i that happened have corners in them that happened the other day with my non-art son did that and I came in and found, luckily it was on a cotton canvas so I was able to put hot water on it and make it pop back out. But if it had been in linen, might not have been fixable. Yeah. So definitely the way to do it. Anytime it's the littlest bit off here or there, that's when you get humidity in the studio. You start getting the weights a little bit more on this side than this side. It can start kind of bending and stretching and say it's these little thinner stretcher bars the weight of that canvas if whoever has stretched it if it wasn't you or if you've stretched it and you're still new to it you you always torque it just a little bit one way or the other everybody has a pull to one side or the other when they make these things that's when that humidity starts making those bars stretch and it starts putting it out of line if you don't have it straight up and down because the gravity will start pulling on it so that's a great question can you paint on a canvas and then stretch it? In theory. Technically. I've seen people do this. Makes my heart hurt when I see this. It, it so just many. makes me want to. I've seen so many artists that have tacked them up to the wall and paint on it like yes. that. And I'm like, oh, you're just asking for cracks. Yes. Oh. Asking for cracks. Uh, because you would want that to be fully oxidized before you stretch it. And then that can crack even worse. Um, you're asking for somebody that's not being careful to potentially put something through when you're nailing it or tacking it or I almost put a staple through this luckily it's a wide weave so it wouldn't have damaged it but if it was already painted and you put a staple through it I mean it's just it's not worth the damage and the reinvestment of time product and everything else to do that or just it's trying to get it at all straight lined up yes. perfect exactly because you've got to well and you've got to lay down. it down face yeah. down and, and you uh, know where you're going to have a big enough soft enough yeah. clean enough area you know that's going to keep that from getting damaged and when you stretch it you'll look see in our video you're rubbing you it pick it up you yep. staple you pick it up you staple it's a lot of movement a lot of abrasion everything else just don't do that don't make Amy need to have an aneurysm. <laughs> or work, but then you have to go back and try to fix it. And yes. Just, just more yeah. work than it's worth. Yep. Yep. It's Can dangerous. Can you remove deep creasing from canvas by stretching it? 
what okay so yes possibly if it's cotton or unprimed linen when you go to prime it it will usually pop the stuff out even if it's just a slight wave um especially if you're priming it with acrylic because acrylic always shrinks slightly when it's done so that's not a problem um what are you looking you had that sample that was showing how it tightens it up the sample oh okay <laughs> I, I was, I, okay, see how there's the waves on the sides? I, I didn't, but well, just, that didn't. <laughs> Did not compute. Yeah, no. <laughs> I haven't drank all my coffee yet. That's the problem. <laughs> Notice how it's wavy on the sides. See where the boxes are. Okay, can you see the waves to it? Yeah. Those are the unprimed portions. I know this looks clear. This is clear just so. Notice how it's flat there. And wavy on the outside that's tightened up only in those areas and the rest of it has not does that make sense one coat of each of those one coat of just a white gesso one coat of a clear gesso makes that big of a difference on a cotton canvas now linen is not going to pull quite that tight but it will pull slightly tighter okay um, now if it's something that's oil primed that's when you're starting to get into dangerous waters. It's, you may not be able to get some, a pucker or something it like that of it. Depends on how severe the. If it's like a. Wave. If it's a wrinkle. Yeah. No, if it's a wave, you might be able yeah. to. If it's a wrinkle. If it's a crease. Probably not. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, and products like, like Tighten Up can help as a canvas retentioner. Let's see if this says. Uh, I didn't put my reading glasses up here. Don't laugh at me. <laughs> Um, yes, I need reading glasses. Welcome to my world. Um, when applied to the back of the canvas, the fibers swell and shorten, thereby creating tension across the surface. Tension. Um, so it can be used um, for sagging, wrinkles, or ripples, leaving the canvas tight. Dries clear, it won't affect the look of your piece. It can even be applied only to the problem area or evenly across the entire surface. So this is something that, now it does say not recommended for use on polyester based or oil primed canvas. That's because there's rabbit skin glue likely on the back of that stuff that soaked through to protect it from the oil. That's gonna make that have a problem. So you can also take, <laughs> this is Amy's little cheat. You can also take your cotton canvas if it's acrylic primed Put it face down. It's hard to the way I do my canvases, but on a commercial one, lay it face down on a soft cloth, like a like a towel, bathroom towel. You're gonna say iron it? No. Okay. No. <laughs> Have you met me? I don't iron. There's a dryer. You can wet your clothes down and put it in there for that. <laughs> Use those wrinkles out. No. Um, <laughs> I probably I try ironing canvas that worked. I was already laughing. No, oh, Cindy said she needed that tighten up on her face. Oh. <laughs> Um, take this, take boiling water, pour just a little bit on there and a big, like a watercolor mop or a long handled one with a big soft, uh, you know, like maybe rabbit fur or something, something that's very big, soft, very absorbent, just like whack it across that surface yeah. to get it as even as you can to the stretcher bar, take it, get all the excess water out and let it dry. Maybe put a fan or something on it because you don't want that to get wet. Get all down in the wood. You don't want, especially if it's a humid, humid, it might not be the, the best idea. You might want to only do it on a little portion and not pour a lot in there. But that hot water will shrink that cotton up that little bit and tighten it up. I've saved some that really looked like somebody, like, you know, put a fist through it and it was like, okay, this isn't going to, this will need to be thrown away. And, and just in doing that is like a last ditch Hail Mary. Yeah. You know, do you need to do it on stuff all the time? No, don't. But but that was, you know, that will work. This is, I'm sure, much more archival, but. It does that dimension right. every time I put them in the hot water. I know. <laughs> Last question. All right. What's the difference between a canvas that you would buy in bulk that would average to about 3 to $5 a canvas and, um, like, a canvas that would cost you about $25 or more a canvas? Like, what do you think? Crappy stretcher bars, three to five dollars. 
uh, very thin, uh, very low quality cotton. Uh, probably not very much gesso or a very acrylic-y gesso that especially if you use oils are not going to adhere well to it. It's that at three to five dollars is a student grade canvas that you're getting in bulk. That's that's it's nothing more than and, and for somebody that's practiced, that's perfectly fine. Yeah. There is a reason for every price point. And I'm, so I'm not bashing that. If that's what you use and you're practicing, that's great. If you think you're going to get into the Smithsonian on a three to five dollar canvas that they use at the wine and sip, wine and paint, drink and paint and pour. Yeah, <laughs> whatever. If you go paint somewhere because you like alcohol and you like hanging out with people, it's a three to five dollar canvas. Yeah. It is not a twenty twenty five dollar canvas. Then you're talking about quality stretcher strips. You're talking about you know sometimes those can be either hand stretched or you know stretched with somebody right there. It's not just you know being done so quickly and and done by people that aren't trained for that specific job. You know that's where so that comes into control. Play. That's yes. That's quantity better quality, over quality wood. not quality over quantity. It may not be kiln dried, uh, kiln dried wood. It may be really still green wood, so you're going to get more warpage on that. It may not may be a size that should have had stretcher bars, but because it's three to five dollars, it doesn't. So use your head. It's the common sense thing that should apply to anything you buy. If it seems like too good of a deal and it's not on closeout then that means it isn't a good deal. It's yeah. it's a good price point, but it's not a good value, okay? All right, so can we move on to some stretcher strips? Okay, so just going over stretcher strips really, really quickly, because it looks like Katie's getting my little time cards and it looks like we're we're going. So we're gonna go, try to go quick because um, I think we really should, quick today. Yeah, I think we should show people how to gesso because that's something a lot of people mm -hmm. don't know, like real, like really how you should do the gesso. Um, you've got your inexpensive structures that come in pairs. This is your the, the stuff that's going to make your more practice canvases, okay? They come in pairs, so although these actually are actually pick really well, They're, the quality yeah. on them is really nice for, for being in pairs. Um, they're a good value and a good, Let's see. I just want to show you the difference in beading. This is another thing that's those three to five dollar canvases do not have what's called a bead generally on them. Um, all right. So these are just the Creative Mark stretchers. This actually does have a bead, which a three to five dollar, like some of our uh, inexpensive, like the Creative Inspirations and stuff, aren't going to have this. A bead is what your canvas rests on. If you can, can you zoom in to, to you show can that? See it, I think, yeah. Okay. So see this big rounded area? The really cheap canvases that you buy in bulk sometimes don't have that. This keeps your canvas off from touching this. If it touches it, it's called ghosting. You'll be able to see this under your painting um, as you go along and it ages or even wear where some of the paint will abrade slightly. Um, it's got a smooth back. It's just a good basic stretcher strip. Um, anytime when you look at stretcher bars online, they don't come with crossbars and stuff like that. Don't go up above like like really an 18 by 24 because anywhere you're getting like above 20 inches, above 24 inches and on, you really should have had crossbars in it. If it offers sizes other than that, unless you want to make your own crossbars and put something on there, which which for this, these are these are so thin and small, it's it's going to torque. I'm just, I'm straight up with you. That's what's going to happen. These are great for something 16 by 20 or smaller, 18 by 24. If you're really good at stretching canvas and you use like a lighter weight cotton or something or a cotton polyester blend, these are perfect. Then when you're going to kind of the next quality bar up, which is the Pro Light, the B, I'm breaking fingernails left and right doing this. Um, zoom in on that. The Prolite has unique beading on both sides, which number one is gonna make it easier to kind of round it out as you stretch it. Um, you can use either side too. So if one side's got a scratch or scrape, or even a little nick or dent because you drop it on the floor, and these are pines, so they're not hard, you've got the ability to use this other side for it. So you can use either side of that stretch frame once you've got it on there. 
it's still a true three quarter inch depth. So it's perfect for most frames. This is not. You can see the difference. Okay, so um, so if you're you know if you want to use like a like a floater frame or something like that, this would be perfect for a three quarter inch floater frame because once you've got your canvas over it, you can paint that side. It'll be nice and clean. Um, and that's the ProLite. No, I don't believe the ProLite either have uh, crossbars in those. Then go up to the Pro Bar, which is what all of these are stretched on. Make sure I'm not missing. Um, all right, these are the medium duty. Uh, these are one and a half inches deep this way, but one and a half inches deep this way. The wider they are, the deeper this profile is your side that is going to be your outside of your canvas, okay? If it's going across like this, it's the side that's going to be put in a frame and then you've got your back side to staple it on. The beauty of these is look how big that bead is on that thing. It is gigantic. You can really push in. If you if you tend to be somebody that paints and pounds hard on your canvas, that's fine. Those type of bars are gonna be great for that. They've got crossbars. These actually have crossbars where there's the no-notch style crossbar. We talked about those in the after party. And then they've got the T and the B, which are notched to fit kind of over each other. Um, and all that is in the after party. I'm not going to discuss that any further because it's it's all there in that. But these offer a really super tight join in the corner. You can take them. This is not flexing. No. <laughs> I mean, it's a 12 by 12, but you have to get start getting into a pretty significant size where you still don't need a crossbar where that's not going to be an issue. This is this size with you know those and you still I can flex it just a tiny bit that's amazing for that size so and Katie if somebody can break it is it not easy it's gonna be you yeah she hasn't broken it yet y'all I'm good it's my superpower <laughs> all right then from there you go into the heavy duty gallery pro bars which are two inches by one and a half inches. So those are, and you know what? Those are the ones that, oh, this is the profile. Two and a half inches. Good Lord. One and a half inch by two and a half. That's a beefy stretch of bar. your home. Yeah. It's like a freaking baseball. Bat, it really you know? is. Um, the beaded lip on that is, is a whole half inch, okay? Museum quality, these guys have a unique cross brace system where there's two steps in it and you don't have to decide where they go because they notch those for you so you know how many bars you need to have. So the ones that go this way can go into this one, the ones that have to go that way can go into the other one. So you've got two steps, so it makes it so you don't have to worry about notching crossbars. It gives you better strength and it gives you just an easier time putting it together because those ones with the notches, it's, it's like playing with Tinker Toys or, I guess, Lincoln Logs, right? Mm -hmm. And just not being sure what goes with what. So, um, those are already done like that. Now, when we talked about the minimums... I'm a little scared of that one. The Gallery Light, 12 bars you have to buy. But that's three canvases. Three canvases. That's not a big deal. Now, the Pro Light, or excuse me, the Gallery Pro Medium Duty... Um, it is 24 bars, assorted sizes. That's enough for six canvases. But the price on them, I think, is incredibly reasonable, especially considering that these are the ones that are, like, the best medium duty is what they're designed after. Like, I think half the price. Yeah. So, um, and like I said, even in stretching them, I don't, I couldn't tell you for the life of me, monkeying with those, which one is which, because they're just the same. They feel the same. Um, the heavy duty gallery pro bars, those, uh, those go up to, geez, 96 inches. Yeah. <laughs> and those are a minimum of two boxes of six, but that's still, it's still enough for what? Four canvases. Yeah. So three, three, yes, three. <laughs> Math is a four letter word. <laughs> 
just remember that. Um, and then the Profile Extra Deep, that great big one, that's a minimum of six boxes. There's only four strips per box though, so that sounds very daunting. Um, that's 24 assorted bars. How many so, canvases is that? <laughs> if it's four strips each and it's six boxes, do the math. <laughs> no. Do the math. I don't math. I do a lot of things. I not art. Math. I don't math. Yeah, that's right. Three letter word. Thank you. Okay. So, uh, with the best stretcher bars, two to three weeks. Something to consider. Um, they say there's are kiln dried white pine. There's all sorts of types of wood, right? That stretcher bars can be made out of. Um, most all the ones we're looking at are kiln dried. Kiln dried takes all that moisture out before it's made into a bar, so you have a lot less propensity for warping. Um, it's it provides a cleaner cut when they're cutting the wood, uh, less jagged edges. Um, there's different grades of pine. Some people even use spruce. Uh, on the museo bars, they use spruce. Why? Spruce is much stronger. It's lighter. Okay. There's less knots. It does, to me, it's, it's, the difference is very nominal. They could have just gone with pine. I guess probably the best thing about this is it doesn't get dented as easily if you're really whacking the thing around uh, when, you're, when you're making it. Where spruce would be a good duty. idea is if it's only the bar itself. Nobody's going to manufacture these other ones in spruce. It's just not cost effective. There's not a lot of, it's, it's one thing when it's just this little bit that's on here. And really they do that because it's not a lot of wood and this is very thin. So if that was pine, it could potentially snap. Um, why do they not use oak? Why do they not use maple or hardwoods? Because you have to get staples in this, folks. <laughs> and you don't want to look like Arnold Schwarzenegger. I know that sounds ridiculous, but if you've never put true. them together or tried to get staples out of something that you want to take a practice canvas off and change it or restretch it, Literally, you are going to look like Arnold Schwarzenegger. You would be barely stapling that in and then just pounding the tarnation out of it, trying to get it into, and probably denning the staples. Because even, have you ever been, like, like they used to do yellow pine. Remember the old cheap yellow pine stretchers? And you'd go to staple them, and even though yellow pine is a softer wood than white pine, because of the, um, because of the sap in them, yeah. it would be like, chunk, and the staple, would go, yeah. the staple would go, the staple would go, it just it just flattened out. It was like ah. I've had a misfire on yes. on certain things because yes. it just is like nope. Yep. <laughs> so so wear safety glasses. The hardwood <laughs> seems like a. She was laughing at me earlier because I had these on. Hardwood seems like a good idea. It's not. Plus hardwood is going to add so much stinking weight to this. So if you're already looking at at stretchers like this. Hardwood is going to be at least double the weight in most circumstances. If you paint real thick too, man. Oh, can you imagine? Okay. So yes, so not the best idea. Um, and with, with the bus bars, I didn't get selections of those because we'd have to have them drop shipped to us. Um, like the heavy, super heavy duty are, uh, let's see, 24 bars required, the aluminum pro bars, 12 bars, all their aluminum ones are a minimum of 12 bars. With Best, when you buy them, just be aware. With our stuff, you can get the crossbars later. You can decide on things, you can need them. And you don't, <laughs> math is a four letter word. You don't have to figure out what the crossbar would be. If, if this canvas is 34 by, it was gonna be, what, 60 inches? You order the 34 inch crossbars and the 60 inch crossbars, yeah. mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. You don't, just like framing, just because you you have a 16 by 20 inch artwork doesn't mean you need to add on for the outer edge of the frame. Just order the same size. They've already done that horrible four letter math word. Okay, so something to consider. But when you're buying the best ones, they will not just send people crossbars. You have to order them when you do it. If you do their aluminum stuff, you need to order all the hardware that goes with it when you put in your order. So that's something where call and consult somebody if, if you need help with it. That's what people are here for. That's that's what we do. Um, now the Bell Art Stretching System is something, can you put the page up just for, for anybody that's interested? Really where this system is gonna be beneficial to you is, let's say you run a art school 
and you want people to stretch their canvases. Let's, and you, you like to do, maybe you've got antique frames and a lot of antique frames and you want to do the odd sizes those are in. Or, um, or you do, you know, production stuff, just anything or where you're just really cranking out, maybe you paint a thousand canvases a year. Then it probably is easier to yeah. do this yourself. Then this system would be good because it's got the, the machine. You just have to buy the motor for it that you can cut the wood. It does the little holes for the hardware to fit in. It can be adjusted uh, with, you know, hardware so that you don't need your giblets for, for doing it. <laughs> I love that. She gives me this like. They do. It makes me smile inside when Amanda is sad. <laughs> But with that, yes, I am. <laughs> you need the entire setup, though. You need the saw. You need the tools. You need the whole nine yards. You buy the parts and the molding all on that same page. So that's something where you really need to be looking into full production. Yeah. It's not feasible for just us regular artists. It just really isn't. I um, had people that have, like, a shared studio. We'll all go yeah. in together. And a shared studio or, um, you know, Stephen, the director of customer service, Put himself through grad school stretching people's canvases. Yeah, that's true. Something like that would have made it a lot easier and he could have done it very inexpensively. Yeah. So, you know, if you've got a side business for that, you could actually still do art while you're doing art. So, you know, there there is that. Now, um, the Museo one, if you're painting large scale, mm. I mean, this, this looks like it's like the Terminator, you know, moving parts and... And metal of Robocop. It's the Robocop. <laughs> the not, robot not the new one. It's the old, tougher <laughs> Robocop that came out before you were born. Bob's. I'm sure. Um, this is all wear resistant, lightweight aluminum. The extenders for this, and we put these in for the. We have a Facebook episode. Can you put that up of just the. Um, the Museo that's all on this system. There, there's an extender here. I don't know if you can see it where it's cut away. We just you see it on put, one side. We just put it in just to show what you can do with this. You can make structure bars virtually any size. Like um, I got the diagrams that we put online because I just found it really humorous. With these up to 48 inches, you don't need a crossbar. That's how durable the system is. <laughs> Look. A 50 foot or 50 inch by 100 inch only needs five support bars. 50 by 100. <laughs> but it gets better. 72 by 144. A 120, 120 inches by 240 inches. That is the grid work that you would use for that. So you can make something, you can have it all sent in smaller pieces where there's not the freight shipping, put it all together, you can paint it, you can always take it back apart to ship it somewhere. You can get like really crazy with this. And, and you know, after our museum walk this last weekend, the museum meetup, in walking around and looking at some of the ways that artists picked how to try to solve the problem of how big do I paint and how do I do it, yeah. with doing these panels or doing these combinations of, you know, triptychs that are all shoved together, there were some, even in a, a, a museum where it's the North Carolina Museum of Art, ways that people had done it that weren't the very most successful yeah. and you could already see stuff kind of falling apart. So that's a way where if you're painting, like, I mean, you're probably not watching us, just saying, <laughs> because you don't need to learn about this, but that's a way to be doing something really huge scale that's going to be done right. Um, and, and that you can, you know, market to museums and it's going to be already by their standards. Yeah. Um, with those, they're cut to order. Okay, they have the lengths. One to three weeks, it says on the web page. Is that what you're reiterating, Amanda? I was also going to say, if you have any questions, don't order it unless yes. you email or call. Yes. We probably won't know the answer when you order or call, but we will contact yes. the warehouse. Yes. Find out your so you'll you'll be finding out. They'll find out from the people who actually make this to make sure you have the correct information for ordering this. Okay, because it is an investment, so you want to do it right. Also, I had a custom canvas person order that stuff, and he wasn't real sure about it. Oh no! And then he got it, and he called me and said, 
You didn't tell me you were going to sell me the Lamborghini of <laughs> I was going to say, I've The seen, Lamborghini like, that comes like a tinker toy. Yeah. I have to put it together. Oh, he didn't put it together. We did it for him. Oh, nice. Okay. I, I've seen walls with less support braces than that. That's mm -hmm. the crazy thing. The truth. All right. So do we want to show how to gesso as long as we're... Do we have other questions? I can be gessoing while people ask questions. How about that? Two birds of plus two. Somebody wanted to know if you, would, if you would consider the ones with aluminum the ultimate stretcher bar. Um... Depends on how big and what you're painting, what you're painting with. I would, what you're stretching with. Okay, it's, it's like this Lamborghini. It mm -hmm. is a Lamborghini is awesome. It looks great. It's high end. It can get you there in you know yeah. three point seven seconds. But if you're going three point seven miles. Yeah, 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 yeah. You need. Yeah. yeah. So you know, if you're selling a piece of artwork for fifty thousand dollars, get it. H-E double hockey sticks, yeah, you should dang well be doing that. You should not be, you should not be doing this. You should know what gesso you're actually using. We have some people that sell artwork for a lot of money that do not know how to gesso something right and have things crack and fall off. You, if you are paying, getting paid $50,000 for something, you dang well better know your stuff. Yeah. So that's when we asked that museum bar you you should you should you deserve the lamborghini to be painting on if you're selling something for a thousand dollars how much are you paying to put all that together and get it all shipped and the wait time and everything else that's not really your jam you can be driving in the mid-sized toyota you know it, it gets you there it's got the same four wheels might even have the same color chip color i don't know it's it's gonna be more you're gonna be more comfortable with the price and uh, it's probably gonna get better mileage so <laughs> just <laughs> I'm just I'm just saying yeah, we're turning Top Gear real quick here no um, aluminium without the accidents yes <laughs> yeah that's right oh yeah Woo Katie gets two points all right um, so with this I I decided to take the pro bars. I did the GAC 100 on the the bars. Do you think we need to show that? I don't. I think that's no. pretty pretty obvious. It's just a very thin, uh, clear, very yeah. hard coat protective acrylic. Um, then I've got it stapled on. I actually used hemp for this. This is just a raw hemp. Hemp is not linen. Hemp is not cotton. It's the older, more ancient form of canvas before they started using linen. Um, so it's it's very bumpy. It's a very irregular. It's a cool um, texture. It's a very cool texture. What I generally do with these, and Let's I didn't I do with it. this because I did it this morning. You can see some little parts that I would normally go through, and I would take um, a little, little toenail nubbies. clipper and clip nubbies off. This one might be big enough where it might damage the weave, though. Um, Don't pull them. I'm not. Um, <laughs> But I think what I'm going to do first, because it would it would um, hook it in with the priming, is I'm just going to leave it be because then if I went and cut it out, it's already it's supported. Yeah. But I've actually got an interesting plan for this that I want this weird texture on because I'm going to put another primer over it. So um, it needs to have an acrylic priming first. And you can see this is a very thick, getting corners like this is very difficult with something that's I mean, literally this thick. Yeah. You can see it's it's. Katie saw my hands. My hands were all swollen and all marked up from stretching this earlier because it's super heavy duty, um, even without the priming. But it's a feat to get the corners like that. So, um, so why don't we do the priming with it? I would normally use clear gesso because I'm a clear gesso nut. But I think what I'm going to do is actually use the thinned down. Um, some of the um, acrylic gessos like this, like the Jerry's World's Greatest, this is a really good gesso. I always thin it. I'm gonna use pre-thinned gesso. Um, but as you can see, it's like sour cream. It is, let me just take one of these. When we have people that complain about cracking, everybody should know, gessoing 101, this is too thick for gesso. If gesso is the same like thickness of titanium white paint, it's like sour cream and I end up with chips. it is. It doesn't smell that good though. Um, you need to thin this. What gives it the body 
is the things that are absorbent in it, like marble dust, okay, that help you create a really good bond between your gesso and your paint. You never, ever want to use it that thick. Um, and with the first coat, you really want it to soak into your fabric, so you would especially never do that. Don't ever make it so you can see brush strokes with, with stuff like this, because that means it can crack. Even if you go back and sand the little bit of that top part out, that's still got a lot of materials that have body to it, like silicas and marble dust that could potentially crack because there's only so much acrylic resin you can put here for oil to be able to stick to it. So literally there are people that will take this, they will use a primer brush and they will paint it like they're doing house painting and they think the thicker it is, then I only have to put two coats on it. Nope, for the whiteness, yeah. If that's a problem, for the adherence for your thing later when it gets tough and then it cracks, no, okay? So please learn to do so properly. That is the most important thing that you could ever do if you're gonna be priming your, because otherwise all of the stuff that we've just done is to no avail. So I'm gonna use a thinned down gesso instead that I've made because this is the texture that I am gonna be wearing there, that I, Okay, see how that's soupy? It's like, it's like kefir. That's what, what? The drinkable yogurt, right? I know, that would just, I, it's, it's the perfect texture for that. See, it's a little runny, okay? When you gesso, always go from the outside in because it tightens as it goes. You don't wanna start up here, be painting down here because you want it to pull equally from your bars inward. So I always start at the back first. Now this is very thick, so, and I always paint a little bit into kind of the overlap, okay? If there's questions, Amanda, go ahead and fire away. Just interrupt. And always, there's, there's a little bit of excess. Always go ahead and wipe that off right now. You can kind of overpaint later but you don't want any excess could mean potential cracking with that. Um, what if you want to eliminate the texture of the canvas? Could you use a palette knife and a card with gesso that thick? So no, no, mm -mm. you're just gonna have to, A, start with a, th a thinner canvas. Okay, start with a canvas that's do, a, do if you're really worried about something super thick, thin, um, and you're, you're doing it yourself, start with like, um, uh, cotton polyester blend. Polyester is strong and it can provide uh, much less texture. Uh, the cotton will help some with a little bit of thicker weave to it, but the polyester can make it thinner and lighter um, in a much finer weave without like sacrificing strength, okay? Then you go ahead and apply it just like I would be doing with this and what you're gonna do is apply it and sand with, lightly with each coat with a very fine sandpaper or even um, even perhaps uh, like, um, what's the, steel wool. Mm -hmm. The, the not, not the kind that has the <laughs> bricks in it with the stuff for your kitchen. Go, go to the wood store, the wood like Lowe's Home Improvement, something like that um, and get your steel wool. See, I'm just going around this. Notice I'm working it in. You can't see any texture other than the texture of the canvas underneath. I'm trying to kind of get the excess. How does the Jerry's gesso compare with uh, Liquitex or other well-known gesso? It's just different. It's, it's a very, very white gesso because they put a lot of that that uh, marble and probably some calcium carbonate and things like that in it, um, but it does need to be thinned. It's 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 kind of like everybody's got their favorite brand of acrylic paint. Everybody's got their favorite brand of oil paint. Yeah. A gesso can be just as personalized. Um, that's you know they sell it in some really little containers. You could try some different ones if there's a brand of paint that you already um, are very fond of. Try their gesso because a lot of times you're already kind of used to how they formulate things. Mm -hmm. um, I am not a fan of Windsor Newton paints by nature. I, I use their gouache a lot. Um, I used their oil painting starting out as a college student, 
but there's something about how their gesso is done that I just love their gesso. Both their white gesso and then their clear gesso. There's only a couple companies that make clear gesso. Um, it's much thinner. It absorbs really nicely, but then it still has a very absorbent, it levels, okay? So it, so it goes into your surface. It doesn't provide a lot of texture that you've got to sand off, but it, um, your paint absorbs really well into it so you get a really good bond when you're painting, which, which I don't, I like to use oil primed linens, pre-made oil primed linens, um, but if I'm going to make my own canvas and I'm going to use oil, it absorbs well enough where it, it absorbs those underpainting layers that I do um, that are thinned down, which you want, for, everybody says, no, it should sit on top. You still need some adherence or you're going to have problems with that coming off. And especially if you've got a really resinous acrylic based gesso, you're going to have problems with it slipping off, especially if you use things like odorless mineral spirits for your, um, for your first layers. So that's a much better gesso uh, for that kind of stuff in my opinion and in my preference. Is it that way for everybody? No, not necessarily. That's just what works the best for me and my own personal painting style and practices. Um, that clear gesso though, that stuff is the bomb. I like to draw with, um, with charcoal on wood panels and then put a fixative, a very light coat of fixative just so the charcoal or the graphite doesn't move. And then I can put clear gesso over it so then I can oil paint on top of it. It protects that panel, but it offers enough bite with the clear silicas that they use where you can see the drawing through it, but then have the paint over it. And it's a really, really cool thing that just works really well for the types of techniques that I want to use. Um, not all clear gessos are the same either. There's some that are very cloudy and that's a very clear one if you apply it properly. Okay, as I'm doing this, I'm scrubbing it into the substrate. I'm not worried about this being as white as possible because this is a very dark fabric. So I'm gonna, if I'm worried about it being really white, white, I'm gonna get that with subsequent layers. Right now, I'm just worried about making sure that it's worked into all the fabric so it can tighten equally. Now, do you say that you usually do three coats? Yes. And what do you use to thin it? Um, a little bit of water or like maybe an airbrush medium. It's usually just a little bit of water. With the Windsor Newton, I don't need to with the white. I'm not using their white today though. Do you have a clear gesso preference that won't turn milky when you put it on darker canvases? Um, it, it has to do with, with doing it in thin enough coats, number one. The thicker, just like, just like with matte acrylics, because it is matte, just like with matte acrylics, you don't want it to be super thick with like gels and stuff because it'll trap the air in it and it will stay cloudy as it dries. But um, if you do it in, in a good thin coat, like I would be with this, I mean, those you can see the, the texture of the fabric right through it. If you want to, you can put those down and, and do a close up. And I know it seems silly that I'm not using a priming brush for this, but I'm so, I guess, just um, OCD about gessoing and about it pulling perfectly tight that I would rather use a soft synthetic filbert. Are these the same? Yes, exact same uh, cotton canvas. It's from this big roll back here. I think it's the size that we've got listed on the um, on the cart, the JL, was it 40? Six cart. So this is the gesso. Yep, that's this clear gesso. That. that is, this is the canvas raw with the tinted clear gesso. So it just looks like, almost like a nice wash of color over it. It's just enough to tint the, to tint the gesso itself. And that's um, actually gonna be done. If you follow my Facebook page, that is actually going to be done for a commission. Now, if you wanted brush strokes in there just for your own textural preferences. You do not want gesso brush strokes in there. You want to use gel medium in there. Do not, again, gesso is formulated to be absorbent. So it's got body of bodies of things that are not flexible materials in it to help A, whiten it, and B, offer absorbency 
if you use that, it's like expecting to use stucco on a house. That's very absorbent, but then thinking that on this surface being flexible, yeah. that if you flex it as you're painting, it's going to not crack and fall off because it will. We had problems with, uh, people have, have said that they had problems with the Jerry's Gesso before. I gessoed it with my techniques without thinning it. Had no problems. The techniques that they said they used, I gessoed it with. Things cracked, there were issues. So you have to know how to properly apply the gesso for whatever type you're using. Um, it's always better to err on thinner is better. Thinner adherent coats. Always, if you want body, use a gel medium. Don't, don't use your gesso for that. So like, if you know what the background of your painting is gonna be, you would suggest doing like you did with the... Uh, not necessarily, because what that is, is is I was taught to, I was trained to classically paint. We usually used a burnt sienna, that's actually a raw sienna but we used some sort of ground color to tint the canvas or the panel or whatever, just so that it's some people, for some reason, it's less of a problem with starting out with a brush stroke uh, on a tinted canvas than something that's clear white. And you can use, you know, classical techniques, you have kind of a medium colored surface of, of 50, you know, percent gray value tone, which is usually your ground, and then you can pull your highlights and darks out, and then you can go from there. Um, that is actually a color. It's a it's a, a dog that passed away from uh, somebody's a, a group of coworkers are um, having the commission done for the coworker, and uh, the dog is running on the beach, and it's like a shepherd mix. What? Oh. It's not here. Oh, okay. No. <laughs> Nope, not here. I was like, wait, are you spoiling this? <laughs> no, 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 it's not. It's not anybody that's that's watching this. Um, so it's it's in the shepherd's um, features. Oh. And you can see the sand under the water, kind of how as the water pulls out, you can see that little bit of kind of sand color coming through. So that was just kind of already in there with um, everything else. And I like showing ground color through. And sometimes I use really bright ground colors. And sometimes I use ones that fit really nicely in the picture, and that just worked really well. So um, so you don't have to, to tint it at all, it's just I prefer to do that. And what I would do normally with the gesso is once I was done, I would paint this a solid color, yeah, with which, with, or stain it kind of a color with whatever medium I was gonna be working on. So if I'm doing oil, I would paint it an oil primed, uh, a thinned color using some lavender essence to thin it out and just kind of stain it with that. Um, if I was doing acrylic, I would paint a couple coats of uh, a straight acrylic color and go from there. How long does gesso take to dry? Uh, it depends. <laughs> Funny story. <laughs> it depends on how humid it is where you are doing it because we had a lot of rain over the weekend when I was working on these and it should have been about two hours, um, and it took more like four hours just be The clear takes a little longer to dry than the white, um, just because there's a little bit more resin in it. And um, when I turned on the air conditioning then and um, put them on just a dog pen so it got air from the bottom and everything else, it dried a lot faster. So it just depends on where you're at. Obviously, if you were in a very dry environment, it can start drying on the sides while, yeah, while, you're, you're, doing it. while you're doing the top. So, um, let's see, I'm going down the sides just to get any extra that's kind of gooping up. I don't know if it's probably easier to see if you want to zoom in on this. I'm actually, this is a very rough, if I took this and was just brushing it across, see how that's not gonna get in there? See how that's missing everything because it's very rough surface. So I'm actually taking this and scrubbing it in. This is the best way to gesso and not get your brush marks. Scrub that in, then go back and kind of almost dry brush that texture away from it being laid down. Cause you don't want stuff like this staying there. It's, it's not, it doesn't have, um, because it's, because gesso doesn't have all the preservatives of a regular paint, 
um, and you go through you know when you use gesso you use a lot more of it so it's something that doesn't sit around so much as paint it's not going to have the high amounts of formaldehyde and and things like that as um, as other you know painting mediums are going to acrylics and stuff like that um, this is stronger than the clear gesso really has very little smell to it. What, I smell stuff. You put your name in paint cups like I put mine in my Starbucks. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Hey, it's not solvent. I smelled that stuff too. So, all right. See, I'm just working my way around slowly. Just, I'd rather it tighten up from the outside to the end. Um, are there other questions as long as we're doing this? I've been pretty much letting them go as they come. Okay. Um, does anybody have a question on how any of the things we've talked about, time for doing this, uh, technique, uh, materials? Didn't, I think Omar said something about painting with gesso, like using white gesso. Oh, I missed that one. Sorry, Omar. And that, that he's known people that have done it, um, use it instead of white paint. Oh, no, no, no. No, if you're if you're using something that is successfully working as that, it's got too much acrylic resin in it. I was really not doing the gesso is not supposed to be paint. All this is is pro, is providing a barrier coat. Okay, it's providing a barrier coat. Now you don't have to necessarily do it with acrylics, but it's still not the worst idea because there's chemicals in some acrylic paints that um, can damage fabric over time. This is just providing a barrier it's it's tightening your canvas number one okay so because everybody even me there's it could be a little bit tighter than than especially with a fabric like this then I could naturally yeah. physically get it it helps tighten it properly and then it's helping seal it okay it also which also helps prevent in case there be mold or mildew or things like that that attack the back of your canvas in a an, in a not climate control environment this is going to protect your painting from being eaten from the back. That's why you want two to three coats because a conservator or somebody that knows what they're doing could go back in and fix the, you know, clean the damaged fabric to get rid of the mold and kill it. But if you don't have this protective stuff in between. Yeah. Sarah wants to know if it's really necessary to sand between coats if the coats are super thin. No, and you don't have to sand between coats at all. I like the texture. I rarely sand between coats. Um, like with something like this, I might sand just to get some of the little nubbies, just so it's not quite. Like I've done, I've, <laughs> I did one with, and it wasn't even this, I did jute. What I was thinking, I don't know. That's 72 by 60. Hey. So it's huge. Good Lord. Um, had to use a power sander to do the sanding. Uh, with jute, you get some strings and just fuzzies and crap that sticks up all over no matter how you do it. I tried to pumice it first. I thankfully did two of them over, it took four days. One's a little bit smaller than the other, but they're both pretty similar size. And um, I had to sand with every coat just to get all the, the fuzzies off because I didn't know what I was going to be doing with it and I wanted to err on the side of less texture is, is more just in case I wanted to do something really realistic with it. Ask me where those are right now. Still sitting. They're sitting in my bedroom. Yep. Um, one has a very beautiful burnt sienna tone ground that took two days to do. Um, but um, I, you know, this one, I, I don't even know if I'll bother to sand it because I kind of like the, the texture that's popping up with it and kind of what I'm thinking is something that I need the texture to do next coats of fun things with. So, um, so you don't have to. Obviously, if you're wanting to do portraiture, if you started with something rough like this, and you don't have the time, inclination, energy, or the funds to um, to get something different to paint on, you can add more coats and sand each coat. And you can get something that's you know relatively smooth. I mean, this isn't really that bad when you look at it. It's not that bad for one coat in. It's not super. No, it's got a lot of cool texture, but it's not. No, but but it's you not, could. The difference between the highest part and the lowest part is not right. huge, so it's right. not going to cause problems. Right. So would you ever gesso the back of the canvas? No, 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 no. 
Nope, you don't want to do that. Right. How does this differ from watercolor gesso? Watercolor gesso has an absorbent, more absorbent ground put into it. Um, and we're going to be doing watercolor uh, pencils. And I think it's JL50 is watercolor pencils, watercolor sticks, and some other things. And we're actually going to talk about watercolor grounds because those type of the sticks and things like that tend to lend itself to kind of some cool mixed media. So we're going to do a little experimenting with the grounds because there's even some colored grounds that... Um, that I saw that Daniel Smith makes. So we're getting in each of those to try some different things on. Um, because I think that watercolor pencils could be used in a cooler, more modern medium, mm -hmm. like enhancing some things on canvases with that ground. So, so we're gonna try some kind of fun stuff like that and see how well that absor those absorbent grounds work because I've not used them before. So I'm not, without really testing them and working with them, it's hard for me to explain. I, I know how they work in theory and from reading literature, but saying, hey, this is works like this, or this one's better than this, or absorbs more than this, it's hard to know. Um, so with PVA sizing on raw linen, would mm -hmm. you be able to paint directly on that, or you still want to gesso it with clear? If you want to keep the you can. The, the PVA is a barrier, okay? Um, it's not designed to be absorbent. It's designed to seal that fabric from the potential of oil, the, the acids and oil reaching down to the fabric and eating it. So you would still, just because you seal it with PVA, doesn't mean that you wouldn't want to go ahead and the clear gesso has much more absorbent capabilities than the PVA. The PVA kind of makes things slick and shiny the times that I've used it. Um, and the PVA also, you better be really good at stretching your canvas because your the PVAs um, don't tend to shrink the canvas like I expected. Yeah. Rabbit skin glue will shrink a canvas, let me tell you. It turns into a, a sometimes you you probably shouldn't have stretched your canvas as tight. I've had yeah, them so actually <laughs> warp the, the stretchers from me stretching thinner linens really tight. Um, so, but, but if you're... If you're going to be putting clear gesso, clear acrylic gesso primer on, don't waste the time with the PVA. The clear acrylic will do the exact same thing as the PVA. So you're just you're just doubling up your workload for something that's going to offer that same protection because this has an you know uh, an acrylic resin in it. So that's going to provide that barrier for for your um, for your linen to be protected. If that makes sense. And you do go through it with this. This is very absorbent. You go through a lot of gesso with that first coat. Your other coats subsequently will be a less. much less and yeah. then much less even with the next coat. But listen. That's already tightened up some. It was pretty tight. You could you could drum it, but it didn't sound that. It sounds tighter because of the gesso on it, obviously. But So with this method. Yes. Where you paint until you get to the middle. Mm -hmm. Then... By touching the middle, you would basically be able to gauge where the rest of the dryness is. Like, okay. if the middle's dry, the rest of it should be fine. Um, okay, with this, the best, the best way to tell if it's dry enough to paint the next coat, if it feels dry and not damp, not cool, cool dry. Yeah. Um, if it's cold, it's not cured all the way. Mm -hmm is the best the best way to tell for gesso and once you're done with the last coat of gesso you need to let it age for about 24 hours just to kind of permanently just bond everything together um, make sure all the air and stuff is out of it before you start putting other paint on it give it a full 24 hours especially and let especially if you're doing um, any sanding sanding make sure it's not cool or cold at all because you're, you're sanding something that's not perfectly cured. Okay, there we go. No texture, no brush strokes. It's just fuzzy looking. <laughs> so, and that's the other thing is make sure your brush is a little bit damp before you start and use synthetics. Acrylic gesso just eats the snot out of your brushes. Just bonds and it's really hard to get out. So I'm gonna let that soak for just a little bit. Uh, are there any other questions? Uh, somebody said, where have you been all my canvas stretching life? 
right here. <laughs> oh, if you need, if you have cheaper canvas and you need to, can you regesso for better results and better tightness? The first coat is what shrinks it. Mm -hmm. After that, it's sitting on top of another coat that's done its job. It's not going to permeate down through this coat, so it's not going to shrink it further by putting more gesso on and more gesso on. It's just offering you better layers of protection, especially with something that says, and you'll see there should be white sticking through this. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's very normal, especially in a larger weave canvas like this. There's people that flip out when they see this, especially with oil prime linens and they get the roll. This is normal. With oil prime linens, the rabbit skin Sweet. glue is clear. You're going to still see a little bit of white through it, okay? And it's absorbed into the fabric. This is just very normal. But just because this is like this doesn't mean this is fully protected. I would still do at least another coat. I, I just always err on three. It, it gives you, because you're going to miss somewhere a little bit, especially on a darker weave like this, where the color's not going to be even. And if you do a lot of thin glazing and stuff like that, you're not painting more impasto, you can potentially notice it through there. Anytime something can stand out like a sore thumb, people notice. So you might as well just, yeah. just get. And the thing to do, unless this is one thing that I've got that I'm stretching this just for one person, if I'm gonna take the time and effort to do this, I'm gonna sand four, five of them at once. I'm going to stretch four or five of them at once. I'm going to gesso four or five of them at once because as long as this is already out and I've got to do the cleanup on it, it's much less it. time just to factory, you know, the GM auto line them along the, another car reference for you, Amanda. Thinking of you. <laughs> I annoy her so much. <laughs> I love you. It's fantastic. Also, we had a question way earlier about like weird shaped canvases. Like, oh, yeah. Uh, octagonal versus circular are we ever going to cover that or are we going to let other people handle that first? we don't have the means to make those that's something where you're going to have to consult a carpenter to do that any really skilled car i've got a friend who could do that stuff in his sleep because he's got you know a router where he could put that beaded edge in he could do all that that's somebody that's a woodworker you are not going to find standard uh Companies that that make these on their own, um, you I can, can sell some but, Fredericks, some but yeah. yeah, but they're not. But we don't have the stuff for you to stretch. No, yourself. there's no. not the stuff for you to stretch that yourself. Um, you could always do masonite and stuff like that, but it's not stretched and and mount stuff. But you're gonna have to do a lot of prep work to make it. You know, you well, don't have the stretching something round evenly is a lot harder. Yeah. If if you can't make a nice corner on something square rectangular, <laughs> you are you are just smoking the proverbial art crack. <laughs> to to think that to think that somehow doing it round is gonna end up you know better. It's just it's not. Plus then, consider depending on where you want to show it or who's gonna buy it. There's some moron that thinks stuff needs to be framed, and it's always the person that buys your stuff. Yeah. Then what do you do with that? Or or, okay, yay, it's great, you've made it. So you've had talked somebody somewhere into making this for you. It's it's like you have to talk a better them. woodworker yeah. than the ARC. It's it's like built for the ages, and then you get a gallery show somewhere, and the gallery won't let you show it because it's not the same thickness that they require, or it can't be hung the same way, or... Like have a custom frame made for it. Yes. Yeah. So that kind of stuff can shoot you in the foot more often than it can. So just word of caution... Talk to places like that if you if you already have stuff coming up and make sure before you invest in somebody doing the custom work that it will be feasible to even show it. So, sorry to burst your bubble. That's me crushing hopes and dreams. <laughs> Bonnie said stretching round canvas is like folding a fitted sheet. You just kind of yeah yeah. It just kind of gets rolled up and put in there. Yeah, that's one of those things that you just get angry with and throw it in there. Yeah. Ah! Yeah. Yeah, it's like folding socks. You just tuck those together. But then one always gets stretchier than the other. All right, so are there any last questions? Because I feel like we're, we're yeah. winding it down. Um, if there's other things you want to know that we've missed, leave the questions there I will I will get to it I'm like 
two episodes behind just because sometimes creating for this and playing catch up and everything else I get tomorrow's gonna be my day to answer things yeah. so um, definitely leave the questions in there or you can message me at my artist Facebook page I answer those very quickly um, if it's something that's more pressing and you need you know it's time sensitive yeah. information or in the um, Facebook group yes oh yeah the Facebook group because I check that all the time anytime I have a spare five minutes I'm, I'm always curious and pop that up and enjoy yeah. seeing what everybody's kind of doing and saying and and all that good stuff so um, so in a nutshell this is just kind of the the basics of this the after party will show you everything and you'll watch me make a fool out of myself it's fantastic fun so don't don't throw tomatoes at your screen please mm -hmm. But um, next week, we have our um, artist self-improvement series. And I can't remember what the full title is on that. But if, you, if you look up uh, Facebook Live or Jerry's Live on the keyword for the jerrysartorambo.com website, it'll, it'll pull, I think, get us the business of art. I think you're right. Um, I just looked at it. I we'll it be talking about starting out, kind of. You're there. People are saying your stuff is great. Where do you go from here? We're just going to be talking about some of the basic things about um, considering how to set up a working space, kind of taking inventory of your supplies, uh, you know, troubleshooting what types of things you want to do, um, some kind of practices for starting to look for how to sell, um, all of those fun things you'll need like business cards or possibly a website or a price list. People ask, and you know what? Sometimes if you don't have that ready and don't jump right on it, they're going to go to somebody who does. So, seriously. Yeah. Um, and I'm kind of, I'm really, we're doing this as much for Amy as we're doing it for everybody else. Because I'm always very much like, people ask, because you get to the point where people ask a lot that really aren't serious. So, I get tired of handing people price lists all the time. But then sometimes I'm bad about updating it to current prices because... Then I feel like, okay, I'm giving it to people who, you know, are seeing old prices, whatever. Doesn't matter. Still need to do it. Yep. Um, and if anything, sometimes they're turned off by old prices. So, um, so we're going to talk about all that fun stuff and more and whip you people starting out into shape. And some of you who are, who are out there and you're selling, who have kind of skipped some of the steps you probably should have done. <laughs> we're we're going to discuss all that too. So that is next week. Um, and then we've got more fun down the road from there. So, so tune in for that. And, um, and I hope we haven't crushed your hopes and dreams for, you know, stapling and canvas. It, it is fun to do. I enjoy yeah. it. It's very, it's that Zen I was therapy. Say, it's kind of meditative to me. Oh, uh, it's, it's like, and, and you know what, if, if you do a lot of painting and you, this is the perfect thing for when you get that, uh, painter's block and you don't know what to yeah. do and you're not feeling artistic and you don't want to do your sketchbook, you don't have to be creative to do this. You have to just be tenacious. So this is the perfect time for pulling out that stuff and spending that weekend that you would have been watching Netflix instead, being totally unproductive and then more depressed because of it. Okay. I watch Netflix and do it at the same time. Well, you could as long as you don't mind Jesso in your living. <laughs> Uh, but so this is this is what you can do instead. So don't don't take it, it's it's is fun and, and it, there's definitely a place for people who who want to do it. It's very rewarding. So all right, well tune in next week. We'll do this artist self improvement and we will see you then. Have a great week.